Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the Improv GM, and today is going to be a pros, cons, and steal about a role-playing game that you should know a little bit more about and perhaps should steal some stuff from. Today, what we're going to go over is a game called Legends of the Wu Lin. So, when I was 16, 17, there was a comic book put out by Jademan Comics uh, that showed up at our local comic book shop called Oriental Heroes, better known overseas as Dragon Tiger Gate. And this was a, a comic that like, I, I would rush to try to get because it felt like there were nine people in Champaign-Urbana who read it, and like they ordered eight. So if I didn't show up in time, it, I wouldn't get it. And the art was went from good to like beautiful painted art. What it was about was these martial arts where you would sometimes have a battle going over four issues and there would still be character and plot stuff happening and other storylines going on. But you had, I think still to this day really, some of the most exciting battles I have seen in a comic book. Um, and, and granted, I know there's an entire genre of this type that doesn't normally come up here, but like they were interesting, they were heroic, they... They got into the characters of who these people were, um, and they were kinetic. And I loved the comic. And I, I kept wishing, I'm like, why hasn't there a game that does what this thing does? And then years later, many years later, Weapons of the Gods came out, based on another of uh, these comics called Weapons of the Gods. And I read through it, and it's really confusing in some places, but there's a lot of great stuff in it. And I was working on putting together a campaign for... Weapons of the Gods and trying to figure out all the rules because they were not well put together. And then Legends of the Wulin, I was told, was essentially the successor to that. And so I picked it up and I read it. And it did a much better job of explaining and putting together what these type of fiction is. It takes place in mythic China, essentially. It gives you these lands here, all these different places in it, um, and I'll get a little bit more into how you know about those later, because that's one of the things you should steal about this. There are two things in particular that I think almost all games should definitely steal and put in them. One of them is from this game. The other one is the relationship mapping from uh, Smallville. With this one, you get the, the most interesting combats I have ever seen in a game. They take a while. These are not quick combats, but it's worth it because there was uh, the Mook fight that I used at uh, two different Fear of the Cons, going with basically the same thing. Both groups, which had like one or two people in charge, but not the ones who sort of decided how to do this exactly, both groups decided to just sort of play around with the system in really interesting ways that made this fight that should have been the nothing, here's how combat works, now let's go to the main story, they made it these epic battles that like, I still remember really well. There was Tiger Shark, and Tiger Shark was a lesser legend. Like You have like rank four martial, uh, martial artists, like members of the Wu Lan or what the players are. They have these high-flying, like crouching tiger, hidden dragon style martial arts. They have interior martial art, which allows them to sometimes use elemental effects, gives them all these cool abilities that you can pull off of it. This is where they have to use their chi. For various things, they're like they start at like rank four, and like rank five is the lowest. And like a, a lesser legend is someone who like one PC versus one lesser legend is not a contest. Lesser legend's gonna lose. And there was uh, a couple groups of enemies, like mooks essentially, minions that were in there to fight. And again, just supposed to be if you went through and just used it, it's a quick mop up. But like Tiger Shark was leading these men, and at one point, like when you when you roll, because in the system itself you roll seven dice if you're rank four. Everyone rolls seven dice. And you're looking for sets. Two twos is 22s. Two fives is 55. Three fives is 35. And you've got like a river, which is essentially a place for you to slot in some dice where you get to take it from a set you don't use and save them there. So if I roll two sevens, but I've got another seven in my river, I can pull out that seven. So now instead of 27, I have 37 plus whatever bonuses my martial arts gives me uh, on those attacks. So you end up with, like, you roll, and then each set gives you options to do. But, like, if you're going to change the environment or if you're going to try to do, like, a move or something that is not strictly combat, you have to put those dice down during your initiative. So if you go first, it doesn't, like, you'll succeed as long as it's enough to succeed. But, like, Tiger Shark at one point was kind of getting his ass kicked, so he tried to go, like, out a window because he... uh 
in a previous round, he'd been kicked up to a second story because someone used some knockback to knock him up there. So he's basically up on this little balcony where they've got some tables and stuff for the end. Um, he decides to go out the window. Well, another character who won it, it's called creating a wave, broke his wave by kicking a, a chair in front of the window as he went through it. So you have this really cool dynamic thing that on her turn, the other thing she did was basically grab him with like a chain whip by the ankle and then just pull his ass down to the first floor again. So we have this really dynamic, interesting combat where people are able, you're able to attack people directly. You can actually attack their stats in certain ways, like take down their ability to, to strike or dodge. Um, you, it feels like a kick-ass martial art fight, and it's baked into how the rules work. It's not the kind of hand waviness of fate where it's just a description and the same role. Like, you're putting stuff aside, they have different mechanics for how they work, and it creates really lively, interesting battles at the cost of it's not quick. These battles will take you a little while, but they're worth it. Um, online, however, because things usually take a little bit longer online, especially if you've got some players who don't really kind of learn the rules kind of as much as they should. Online, when I ran a, a longer campaign of this, we didn't hit combat all that much. Because another negative of the combat, besides the how long it takes, is this is a hard game to measure what is a good foe for a certain character. Because you may have a martial art that actually does really well against character A but doesn't do well against character B because it's ass-kicked by character B. But then character A might do much better against somebody else because each of these martial arts, both the external martial arts and how the internal martial arts work and even combine with it, they work differently. They feel like different styles. So figuring that out takes a lot of just kind of getting used to how the system works, which we never really had a chance to describe to explore too much because of how long it took. Um, but the battles are cool. And I've, I've never had a game where I come out going, I remember this battle a lot. Um, but here's the thing. The online campaign, which was great, we didn't use battles that much. All the rest of the things still made it really, really interesting. Um, one of which, you have uh, the secret arts. And I'll actually put a link in the thing about... A cheat sheet I put together to make the secret arts easier because they're really interesting. Like the doctor is able to do sort of doctor things on people, like using medicine to affect someone. Um, the warrior is the easiest. It affects their own internal chi in some respects. The priest essentially can do like like Taoism and the Tao Te Ching and through that actually make uh, basically kind of put fate in your favor or against you. And the, um, the courtier is able to socially manipulate people into like you have if you don't act like you're in rage you get this sort of a negative and that can be a problem if you are a courtier to the court where you show up and suddenly you're unable to keep your tongue still to someone who maybe you should be more respectful to so you can kind of put that together to see your npcs uh the enemies kind of crumble that way it's incredibly cool but it's a little hard to pick up um the world itself is well put together, and one of the things that actually makes this world incredibly interesting is one of the things you should steal. Lore sheets. For all of these different factions and for different places and, and even legends, they have a lore sheet, which I'll show you an example from my campaign, where what you're able to do is actually the characters can buy into what it is they find interesting. So, for example, what you're seeing here is a custom lore sheet I put together sort of for the adventure that they were doing. The Southern Dragon Pirates, who one of our uh, one of our players was a princess of the Southern Dragon Pirate Clan. She was like the youngest of them and working to essentially make her name as a fearsome pirate and was doing a pretty damn good job of it. This is what I gave them when they showed up because they were looking for Tiger Shark because uh, two of the people had actually been in my Fear of the Con games. So when we were doing it online, I'm like, let's bring back this guy who... Both times, their punishment was essentially to send him to their master to get him away from the Black Lotus. And here we had him trying to become a hero. So there was a little bit of poignancy because the characters themselves were tickled that that's who it was. But he was trying to be the good guy. He was captured by the Black Lotus. 
So they come into Golden Harbor and they're looking for him. So what happens in this game is you've got the Buddhist values and you've got their sort of anti-values. And you've got stats in all of those. When you do something that exemplifies one of those values, and another player is like, that was awesome, I'm giving you a deed point. So with the deed point, you get some other bonuses, but one of the things you get is a number of experience points only to be used on lore sheets that you don't spend. The other player spends them. The player who awarded them. So on one hand, it could be like, oh, hey, we just we just met um, Snow Fox, and she she and, and this character uh, really got into it. I want to buy that she's in love with him. And so they bought that. They, they used some of those points. To put, that, put that in there. On one hand, it's a way of the players telling you, this is what I find interesting in this world and in this game, uh, and bringing it in. Like, my players decided, oh, the Empress Dowager sounds kind of neat because they, they knew they were going towards the Imperial City. Then they were looking through and like, oh, she was the wife of the cur of the old uh, uh, emperor who's disappeared. The Her son is essentially surrounded by people he can't trust. Let's bring her into the campaign. So they chose to make her a part of it, which told me, they want to meet her. So I had her brought into it, which led to this big, huge thing. That was really cool. And it wasn't just because I thought it would be neat. It's the players have a valve to tell you what they want. What you can also do, and the reason why, I mean, the, it's possible to just do what I'm about to show you, but you also want to leave it open enough that they can tie themselves into the things they want. So this was one that I used throughout, not all the time, but when we got into, like, sort of, they're in a mission-based thing at this point, like, they knew what they needed to do, I would put this out there. And I'd also put in some specific ties to for the characters. So they're looking for Tiger Shark. And what you'll see here, the ones that are bolder are the ones they chose. When someone does this, they do the cool thing. We had a character uh, in a game I ran where he was a doctor. And he decided, oh, um, because I have compassion pretty high, I'm going to go and help the downtrodden. So he, we had a whole scene where he helped a... Uh, the prostitute had been beaten, give birth, and we did a bunch of stuff with the chi, the other person helped. We had this cool scene, which in another game would probably just have been an interesting scene, but because when it was done, they're like, that was awesome, I'm going to give you a deed point for that, here's the compassion, then they could spend it to get the attention of the Black Lotus in the area and find out where the hideout is because of that, because of what he did. So by doing what his character would do, he's rewarded in the story as well. So, you notice, for five points, you discover where the Black Lotus hideout is. No one else knows that you know. For four points, I put a minus one, you get, you've get you got the attention of the local Black Lotus agents. Like, the rank and file are aware of you, so the, you learning probably has to do with, like, a fight. Uh, or if you take it down by two and to three, um, you become enough of a problem that the higher-ups decide to come in immediately. So the players can take the shortcut, but that means they're going to have to deal with the bigger things, which depending on what they do, might be sort of triggered anyway. Other things about, like, secrets that can be put in there. One of them even put, like, Tiger Shark is a double agent for the Black Lotus, and you discover proof. Or Tiger Shark is true to the Southern Dragon Pirates, and you discover proof. Where I decided to sort of let the players tell me what they found was going to be interesting. I don't always do this. But at this point, I was like, I was in a position where a couple of them had dealt with the character before in a different game. And they had tried to basically turn him from being part of the Black Lotus to being to their masters, which in our case here we had the Southern Dragon Pirates. So I kind of let the players decide, do you want him to be actually reformed or not? This is similar to the way Apocalypse World has you ask questions of the players. And I don't have to put that in there, but in this one, this is one where I was like, either way is interesting. It felt like having him be a double agent for the Black Lotus felt a little like the character hadn't grown at all, but it would make an interesting thing for the players regardless. So I left that up to them. They chose that he was true to the Southern Dragon Pirates and they discovered proof. Awesome. And I even put a tie into one of the other characters with the Han Dynasty. Um, those Han loyalists end up becoming very important. They didn't have to go after it, but you can just kind of drop in some stuff. And relatively quickly, the players just discover... Here's roughly what stuff costs, and you can always figure out if you need to. But, oh, yeah, let's buy, let's buy, put points towards making this person in interested. Or I want this particular organization to now be important into the game. And if more games had it, 
you would have more players engaged, I think, with what's happening because they have a direct conduit through the system to tell you, this is what I think is cool. All you need to do to steal the lore sheets is have something that works as character descriptions, or in this case they use the Confucius values and sort of their anti-values. Give some points for it. Maybe occasionally they can raise them up. Uh, it's not hard to add to most systems. And then they get to give a D point. And this particular one, it does give them some other bonuses, like a plot point or two if you're looking at like uh, like Cortex Plus or a Fate Point or some other little bonus could come up here and there, but even that's not necessary. But And the fact that other players get to spend it means they get to say what they think is interesting about you your character. Or you can just have it so that the character is able to spend it. Any of those things work. Plus, the characters can talk about it quite a bit at the table. That is something that should definitely be stolen. So, I love Legends of the Wu Lin. I love it. My only real cons about it, the combat takes a long time. Particularly for face-to-face, -face, I'm much more willing to deal with how long it would take. Two, the system itself is at times a little more opaque than it should be. The cheat sheets I've created definitely helped a ton when it came to using the secret arts, which are really interesting. And you kind of need players to take some time to look through the book to decide what looks cool. But not only do I recommend finding a copy or getting the PDF from drive through of Legends of the Wu Lin, uh, if you go through, there's a tons of interesting stuff about the world. Jenna Moran wrote a bunch of the, the things in, I think, both this and definitely in Weapons of the Gods. There's all sorts of wonderful small text pieces that really capture the flavor of these sort of legends. Uh, the problem in this one, while they're neat, the stuff is tied together in such a way that it's much harder to find what you're looking for. Legends of the Wu Lin, overall being a much smoother system, is better written to actually discover stuff. So if you're doing one of these games, I kind of recommend getting both of them. Taking ideas from here, like literally just flip through Look at the stuff that's interesting, but run Legends of the Wu Lin. You will end up with a uh, an epic martial art game where the combats become fascinating in and of themselves, where there's a story you can tell about the, con the combats that's not like any other game I can think of because the kinetic action of it is not just... I did this, I used this power, I did kind of whatever. It creates a much more interesting story. And the way that the players are tied mechanically into the world make this this wonderful, vibrant setting where you're not entirely sure where it's going to go because the players haven't told you what they care about yet. So, all in all, uh, Legends of the Wulin, do yourself a favor at least once. Try this game because you are not going to regret it. And if you do regret it, Listen, I'm a dude telling you my thoughts on something. We're not always going to agree. But I think it's pretty cool. And even if not, the idea of lore sheets is something that could be worked into a lot of different games. And once you see how it works, it's very easy to take that idea. And even without having to do the massive amount of buy-in to like write out all these things, but just let them know. You can buy into this organization. If you're doing a Marvel game and you decide, oh, I want to know more about Hydra, you could throw up in about three or four minutes. Here's a couple different ways that you can get into that by spending these particular points you get for doing something that is in character and cool. So Legends of the Wu Lin, steal from it heavily. Love what's going on uh, in the game itself, but it takes some time, both to kind of figure out all the system and to play the actual combats. So hope you enjoy.